This is a video lecture and uh, to accompany the material on Schaefer versus Heitner and Burnham versus Superior Court from our textbook. Um, after reading and studying those cases, you should listen to this video and um, complete the um, worksheet that accompanies it. So these cases offer us an opportunity to revisit and re-examine the traditional basis of jurisdiction established in and in the wake of Penoyer versus Neff in light of the modern jurisdictional analysis established in International Shoe and its progeny. So to place these issues in context, let's revisit our list of the traditional basis of jurisdiction that we established under Penoyer and um, the cases that followed it. So as we recall under Penoyer, um, there were really five traditional bases of jurisdiction. Attachment of in-state property at the outset of the lawsuit, personal service of the defendant in the forum state, domicile, and consent or voluntary appearance. We had added presence to the list, which was a, a, a sort of fictitious um, uh, theory that courts used to deal with corporations in the wake of um, of Penoyer and uh, the courts would deem corporations present in the state for purposes of jurisdiction, but that we crossed that off the list after International Shoe, where the International Shoe Court said really presence is just a way of saying um, minimum contacts and that's the test going forward. So this was our list of traditional bases and the question is now what remains of this after International Shoe? Um, so we're first going to examine the first of those, attachment of in-state property at the outset of the lawsuit, which as we recall was the method that Mitchell had apparently sort of attempted to exercise over uh, Neff in the Mitchell versus Neff lawsuit, um, but the court in Penoyer held that that exercise of jurisdiction was improper because uh, the property was not attached at the beginning. So let's just take a moment um, to recall some important terminology here. First, in terms of types of jurisdiction, we've been studying mostly in personam jurisdiction where the court has power over the person and can enter a money judgment against that person in addition to other types of judgment judgments. Um, we talked about in rem jurisdiction in the context of Penoyer where the court exercises power over the property that is the subject of the suit we add now this additional terminology, quasi in rem jurisdiction, which as the text explains, lies somewhere in between in rem and in personam. Um, in a quasi in rem proceeding, the court is exercising power over the property that's the subject of the suit, but it's um, power only as to the rights of the litigants in the lawsuit as compared to in rem jurisdiction, which is adjudicating the rights of um, rights to that property as against the entire world. Um, then there are types of attachment that we need to make sure we understand about. We talked in some detail about how attachment works in the context of Penoyer versus Neff. Um, and in that case, we were really talking about jurisdictional attachment, where the, um, the court attaches the property, places a lien on the records of the property as a way of exercising power over um, that property or the rights of the defendant in that property, um, as we'll see in Schaefer versus Heitner. There are other types of attachment though, and we need to be sure to understand those as we talk about what's happened to attachment of property or jurisdictional attachment in the wake of international shoe. Um, so there's prejudgment attachment for security where Property may be attached at the outset of the lawsuit, pre-judgment, or during the lawsuit at some point prior to the entry of a final judgment, um, but it's done so in order to um, preserve that property in the event that the plaintiff prevails and uh, needs to tap into that property in order to satisfy the judgment. So this is to prevent a defendant from running off with or otherwise disposing of the property without um, the plaintiff knowing it. And then there's post-judgment attachment which is what Mitchell actually did in the Mitchell versus Neff case, and the court held that that wasn't sufficient for jurisdiction purposes. Um, but that even so, um, none of this really affects the ability of a plaintiff to ask the court to garnish or attach property, levy on property in order to satisfy a judgment um, upon entry of a judgment in favor of the plaintiff at the end of the lawsuit if the defendant doesn't otherwise um, sort of pony up or pay whatever it is that the judgment says that that the defendant is supposed to pay. 
So let's talk about Schaefer versus Heitner then, which um, addresses this question of the viability of a of jurisdictional attachment after international shoe. So this was a lawsuit filed in Delaware by um, Mr. Heitner, and he was a shareholder in the Greyhound Corporation, like the buses, um, uh, the bus company. And he brought what's called a shareholder's derivative suit against Greyhound and, more importantly for our purposes, 28 present and former officers and directors. So the Greyhound Corporation was incorporated in Delaware, um, and, uh, but it did not have its principal place of business there. It had its principal place of business in Phoenix, Arizona. And um, Heitner alleged that the officers and directors of the company did not um, fulfill their duties properly so that, that the stock value um, in the uh, corporation dropped and that that was, uh, that they were to blame for that. So that's what a derivative suit is. It's derivative of the right of the corporation. Um, and he brought that lawsuit in Delaware um, and none of these officers and directors notably um, were domiciled in Delaware. They were all elsewhere. And in fact, the wrongdoing that they um, were alleged to have committed the things that they did in violation of uh, law, according to Heitner, where it was in Oregon. Um, so why could they bring suit in Delaware? Well, he, he contended that these Delaware statutes gave the courts in Delaware jurisdiction. Um, so first, uh, all of these officers and directors, importantly, held stock in the corporation, in the Greyhound Corporation. And there was a Delaware statute, Title VIII, Section 169, that made Delaware the quote unquote situs of that stock, meaning that stock under this statute, the stock in the Greyhound Corporation is located in Delaware, um, regardless of where the stock certificates might be or where the stockholder him or herself might be located. So that stock then could be seized um, or attached under another Delaware statute that was a sequestration statute. So essentially, Heitner attempted to use attachment of property at the outset as a basis of obtaining jurisdiction over those 28 present and former officers and directors who were otherwise not present in Delaware by having their stock that's present there by virtue of the CITUS statute seized under the sequestration statute. Um, well, the officers and directors didn't like that, and they uh, made a special appearance, which we've talked about before, uh, and filed a motion to quash service and to vacate, vacate that sequestration order. Um, however, the trial court denied the motion and held that jurisdiction was proper and the Supreme Court of Delaware eventually affirmed, um, holding that this is the kind of attachment of property at the outset that Penoyer and Harris versus Balk in the meantime, which was also discussed in your text, had authorized. So the case comes to the Supreme Court in that posture and raises this question. Um, whether it is the standard of fairness and substantial justice set forth in international shoe should be held to govern actions in rem as well as in persona. In other words, it, does jurisdictional attachment survive international shoe? Well, skipping ahead to what the court held, the court held that it uh, that if it, it does not survive, that international shoe is the standard and. Um, that minimum context must be present without regard to the plaintiff's ownership, or the defendant, I should say, the defendant's ownership of property in the forum state. So what's important for us to understand, um, at least at first, is the, what the majority's rationale was. And what reasoning did it offer to support this conclusion? Why does international shoe trump the traditional basis of jurisdiction of attachment of property at the outset? Well, the court said that jurisdiction over a thing um, the property at stake in the suit, um, or not, not at stake, the property present in the forum state is really what I should say, um, is really the same as jurisdiction over the interests of persons in a thing. The court says you really can't, uh, a court cannot adjudicate the interests, um, adjudicate anything about the property itself without also adjudicating the interests of the persons in that thing. So, um, Further then, the court held that interests of persons can only be determined if that person has minimum context with the forum sufficient to satisfy due process. Um, and that standard is the international shoe minimum context standard. Um, also important for our understanding of the case is this property as contract framework that the court established. Um, so 
property alone, we just said, the court held, is no longer sufficient to support jurisdiction in the forum. But, the court says, property may provide contacts among, among the forum state, the defendant, and the litigation. So here's where it lays out a framework um, uh, concerning the extent to which the property in the forum state may provide a sufficient contact under international shoe. So first, the court says, when the claims in the lawsuit are as to the property itself, so ownership of the property, it would be unusual for the state where the property is located not to have jurisdiction. So um, Joe and Bob uh, both claim that they have ownership of a piece of property in the state of Oregon. Um, the quiet title action to uh, determine ownership of that property, um, both of those litigants would have sufficient contacts by virtue of their claim to the property itself. Similarly, the court said, where the claims are for injuries suffered on the land of an absentee owner, the presence of the property may favor jurisdiction. So where, for instance, Mr. Neff owns property in Oregon, um, but he's not there, he's an absentee owner. However, somebody nearby wanders onto his land and falls into a ditch and gets hurt, and they contend that he's liable for that injury. Um, whether or not he can be served in state or otherwise has any other contacts with the state, the fact that he owns the property on which the injury occurred and out of which the lawsuit arises is likely to be enough to establish the requisite minimum contacts under international shoe. However, the court said, where the claims in the lawsuit are unrelated to the property in the state, there's no jurisdiction there unless there are other contacts. And the court said that's really what's going on here, that the um, officers and directors own stock in the corporation, but that stock is not the subject of the lawsuit. Um, very, very peripherally at best related to the claims in the lawsuit, which are for wrongdoing in managing the corporation. The fact that they own stock is um, really irrelevant to that. Um, so the court said, you know, the, 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 the property being unrelated to the plaintiff's claims is problematic here. And beyond that, there just aren't sufficient additional contacts. Um, they said their positions as officers and directors is not sufficient. And that's really their only other contact with the forum state. Um, and in fact, the court sort of suggested here that if the Delaware legislature had wanted to make officers and directors of a corporation subject to suit in the forum state simply by virtue of their positions as officers and directors, then it could have said so. The court actually is explicit in that regard. And in fact, as the notes after the case tell us, the Delaware legislature responded to um, Schaefer versus Heitner by enacting just such a statute, hold, which um, does render officers and directors uh, subject to personal jurisdiction in Delaware. Uh, by virtue of their positions as officers and directors, and that statute has um, with, withstood um, constitutional challenge. Um, there were a couple of concurring and dissenting opinions that we want to take note of before we move on. Justices Powell and Stevens, um, although in slightly different ways, both said, um, I agree with the outcome here, but I think that you go a little bit too far, majority, in um, making this sweeping rule that international shoe always has to be um, satisfied because both of them seem to think that if there was real property present in the state, which wasn't the case here, the property here was um, stock, intangible, personal property. And, um, but that where the property located in the state is real property, they said that may alone provide sufficient contact for the exercise of quasi and room jurisdiction. But those were just concurring opinions um, and not the majority. Justice Brennan notably dissented, and we see reflections of this um, in Burnham versus Superior Court as well. And we've said before, Justice Brennan never met a case where jurisdiction wasn't proper. He's very expansive in his view of um, personal jurisdiction. He held, um, he would have held that um, the international shoe standard applies, but that it's met here because the directors and officers voluntarily associated themselves with the state of Delaware, invoking the benefits and protections of its laws by virtue of their positions as officers and directors, um, by entering into a long-term and fragile relationship with one of its domestic corporations. So um, while the majority said the Delaware legislature hasn't made it so that officers and directors subject themselves to suit by virtue of their positions, Justice Brennan said that doesn't matter 
um, that in, in, the, their position in and of itself constitutes a voluntary connection with the state, purposeful availment of the benefits and protections of the laws, and suffices to support jurisdiction. So um, let's see what um, about attachment of property after Schaefer, what, um, what the case does and does not decide. So for one thing, um, we know that attachment of property is no longer alone sufficient to establish jurisdiction where the property is unrelated to the suit. Those are the kinds of quasi in rem jurisdiction cases where the claim is not to the property itself. Um, that'd be like the Mitchell versus Neff case where uh, the claim to the property was not the subject of the suit. Mitchell was trying to recover legal fees, but he was trying to use the property for a, in a jurisdictional attachment um, way to obtain jurisdiction over the landowner. Um, attachment of property, however, is still needed for NREM or quasi-NREM jurisdiction where it's a claim to the property itself that is at stake in the suit. Um, so quasi-NREM still exists, but is going to be limited to um, the type of quasi-NREM jurisdiction where the property itself is the subject of the suit. Um, quasi-NREM or jurisdictional attachment um, will not work where the claims are unrelated to the property because Schaefer versus Heitner holds that um, sufficient contacts are needed beyond that property where it's unrelated to the suit. As to that, uh, those cases where the property is unrelated to the suit, though it still may be attached in certain circumstances. For instance, it may be attached as prejudgment security. So going back to the beginning of this video lecture, we talked about attachment for prejudgment security as one method of attachment, and that persists after Schaefer versus Heitner. And furthermore, unrelated property may be seized to satisfy a judgment. So the case doesn't change that result either. So what's become of our traditional basis of jurisdiction after Schaefer? Well, we have to cross off the list attachment of in-state property at the outset. That is no longer alone a sufficient traditional basis of jurisdiction because Schaefer held that um, the minimum contact standard had to be met, um, that the presence of property in the form state alone is not going to be enough. So that brings us then um, to a segue into Burnham because um, we next have to visit this question of what about personal service in the forum state? Um, the um, question here again is uh, after Penoyer versus Neff, the, um, uh, the court had held that personal service in the forum state was a sufficient basis of jurisdiction um, in and of itself. But what about after international shoe? Did that change the result in those cases? So this is what we call transient or tag jurisdiction, where the defendant is transiently just passing through the state, is transient, has a transient presence in the state, or is tagged while present in the state, tag your it, um, um, like a relic of the old childhood game. And um, Burnham versus Superior Court raised that very issue for the Supreme Court. So this was actually a uh, divorce case where husband and wife, Dennis and Francie, had a marital residence and children in New Jersey, but they separated and planned to divorce, at which time Francie moved to California with the two children. And um, although it wasn't originally the plan, she ended up filing a suit for divorce there. At that point, then, she needed to get Dennis served. So... Um, he flew to California on business, stayed the weekend after to spend the weekend with his older child, and when he brought the child back to um, the child's mother's house, the ex-wife Francie's house, uh, he was served with process. So not the best end to his um, weekend there. Uh, he made, again, a special appearance, which we've said is no longer needed under the federal rules, but uh, still persisted at this time filed a motion to quash service of, uh, process, which the California Superior Court denied. Um, he then sought an extraordinary writ of mandamus from the California Court of Appeal, much like we saw in both Worldwide Volkswagen and the Asahi case. And um, the, he was unsuccessful in doing so. The California Court of Appeal denied the writ under Penoyer, holding that um, personal in-state service is a traditional basis of jurisdiction, and um, that's what happened here. So he was subject to the power of the court on that basis. 
Uh, the case then comes to the Supreme Court and raises this central question, is personal in-state service still a sufficient basis for jurisdiction? Um, it had always been that way, but what about international shoes minimum context test? Did it supplant that traditional basis of jurisdiction like it did the attachment of property at the outset basis? Um, and there was a pretty strong argument that um, it did, in fact, and this is what um, uh, the defendant, um, Dennis Burnham, had argued in the case. He said, uh, first of all, international shoe is the modern test, and second of all, look at Schaefer, the court's recent decision in that case, where the court used the word all uh, and was very um, direct in doing so. So going back to that statement in Schaefer where the court held all assertions of state court jurisdiction must be evaluated according to the standards set forth in international shoe and its progeny. So the question before the court then was, um, what did all mean in Schaefer? Um, the case presents us another opportunity to practice our counting of the uh, um, uh, judges who might have joined one opinion versus another. So in this case, Justice Scalia wrote what we call the plurality opinion. Three others joined him, and he held that regardless of Schaefer, Jurisdiction is proper in this case because it's always been that way. He says tradition is strong, tradition has meaning, and in this case the tradition is that personal and state service is enough, so it's enough here. Justice Brennan, however, wrote separately and three others joined him. He agreed the jurisdiction was proper, but he said the international shoe minimum context test should apply. So he thought that uh, Mr. Burnham had a good argument when he said Schaefer says all. Justice Scalia explained that that takes that statement out of context, that when Schaefer said all, it really um, meant uh, that all assertions of in rem jurisdiction um, or all assertions of in personam jurisdiction must be subjected to uh, that standard um, and drew a distinction on that basis and not that uh, and held that it didn't affect this personal in-state service uh, category of cases. So then um, Justice Brennan, applying that stand, international shoe standard, said tradition is relevant and that it puts defendants on notice that they may be subject to suit there, and further that a transient de defendant who's passing through the state avails himself of benefits and protections of the state law, state's laws. They can be helped by uh, emergency response that uh, should they be injured there. Um, they, the police protect them while they're there. They can travel on the highways. They enjoy the fruits of the state's economy, just like Mr. Um, Burnham had done in coming to California for business. Um, then there was the ninth justice, Justice Stevens, who uh, was just in a good mood with everyone, I guess, and said basically everyone is right. Um, justice uh, Stevens, instead of taking the side of one or the other so that there could be a clear rule on this, held instead that, for me, it is sufficient to note that the historical evidence and consensus identified by Justice Scalia, the considerations of fairness identified by Justice Brennan, and the common sense displayed by Justice White all combine to demonstrate that this is indeed a very easy case. So the result is, like Asahi, no clear rule on tag jurisdiction. Everybody agreed it was proper here, but there was no agreement about whether it was proper because of tradition or proper because international shoe applied and was satisfied. Thus the aftermath of the case. First, deck. We, we know that tag jurisdiction is usually proper, but what if the contexts are slimmer than Dennis Burnham's in California? And um, the text raises a hypothetical after the case where um, a non-resident defendant is served with process while flying in an airplane in the airspace over the forum state. So we'll talk about that, that example in class and um, other variations on the facts of Burnham um, to see where the line might be drawn between where jurisdiction is proper and where it's not and how we deal with the fact that there is no clear um, rule from the court in this case. And then secondly is what's left of our traditional basis of jurisdiction. We have our list. We know that we crossed off attachment of in-state property. We know that we've crossed off presence. But what have we done with personal service in the forum state? Uh, all we can say is that we've added a bunch of question marks. Um, we know that it's likely to be proper in most cases, but um, we don't have a clear and definitive rule about why that is so. Does do minimum contacts, um, does the minimum contact standard apply or does it not? 
That is still the question.